and it's it's all right let's try this again it's been a little crazy this evening so hopefully uh you all come back and join me uh, i had to do a little bit of a fresh restart and i had to clear uh the streamlabs clash a and uh, rebuild uh the scenes and everything again so uh, a little bit of a lock up and everything that update kind of screwed me up and everything so here we are let's see here if we can get this uh ball rolling looks like everything is kind of uh rocking along now i can see myself moving a little less buffering uh uh youtube's giving me the green thumb saying everything is uh going well and you know Little things, little things that just, just bug to, just, just love to bug the heck out of me uh, and stuff. But uh, we'll see how well uh, uh, things get going and everything. All right. So thank you, Jim, for joining me back. Thank you, Kevin, for joining back. Thank you, Paul, for joining me, uh, coming back and joining me. And thank you, everybody else that's about to pop in, hopefully, fingers crossed, because I had a nice big old crowd of people, and uh, it would look... Um, it would, uh, I would love to have everybody back in uh, if they didn't give up on it, you know. All right, there's, uh, there's Kevin. There's Mike. Excellent, excellent. Thanks, guys, for coming back and joining me. Man alive. Lord of mercy, it's been a, one of those evenings. Right, right, right. All right. So, you know what it is? To be honest with you, it's because I'm having to drink Coke tonight and I don't have Dr. Pepper. That's why. <laughs> I swear I think every time I don't have a Dr. Pepper in my hand I get jinxed. Alright, there's uh Rain Man, thank you. Hopefully Debbie Miller will pop back in in a moment. Love having when she joins us and everybody else. Uh so you know, freaking Coca-Cola. <laughs> All right, all right, all right. Uh, can I turn up the volume? Can I pump up the volume? Let's see what we got with volume. This is, I had to start everything new and fresh. So let's, uh, let's make sure that uh, everything is everything here. All right. All right, let's see here. That's about the most I can do on the volume. Uh, would you be able to turn up your speakers on your computer and everything? Uh, yep. Floyd, Floyd says too many green beers. Floyd that, you know, if the, unfortunately, if I drank, that may possibly be true, but I don't drink. So, you know, gonna have to blame it on the Coca-Cola. <laughs> hey, Elise, welcome back. All right. All right. Let's see here. Okay. Oh, Roger, thanks for coming back and everything. So, uh, uh, t uh, Trina, um, check your uh, your volume on, on, the, on the YouTube side, but also your speakers on your computer, and uh, let me know if uh, uh, the volume is uh, improved. Uh, everybody else, a sound check. How do I sound? Can you, am I coming through loud and clear? Uh, because I did have to rebuild my Streamlabs uh, and everything, and I might not not have gotten the volume settings up and all uh okay all right all right so yeah floyd says ah oh, that's your problem you don't drink you should start drinking <laughs> okay so tonight guys and girls um i want to i want to create a project but at the same time i want this to be a q a and, and usually when we get to the end of my classes, um, you know, when I ask for questions and stuff, you guys are just ready to get away. You're, you're like, okay, my head is full. I don't really have any questions to ask. I don't want to drag this on. I'm going to bed type of thing because it's late. It's late at night, you know, and we usually run for a few hours. So what I'd like to do is we do have some new users coming in. And we have new people that are, that are joining the channel. Uh, and everybody has some kind of obstacle that they are running into within the Vetric software, or if they're using TNG, the Planet CNC TNG, or uh, CNC USB controller or something, or what have you. And what I'd like to do is I'd like to kind of, uh, because I'm sure everybody would love to hear questions uh, and then the answers, you know, the answers to them. I've seen a lot of questions in the, we have the Digital Woodcarver Owners uh, group. For those of you that are not part of that group that aren't Digital Woodcarver Owners that are joining us tonight. Uh, and uh, there's a, there's questions in those groups. And I'd like to go through and answer some of them and stuff. So uh, 
Uh, thanks, Debbie. It's good to see you. And our excellent Trina. I'm glad to hear that things are much better and all that stuff. So good. So what I'd like to do is um, I'd like to do a bit of Q&A, you know, questions and answers and everything. But I'd also like to kind of touch on some things uh, that uh, it, just in case there aren't a lot of questions, uh, uh, in case there aren't a lot of questions, uh, kind of to fill the space, you know, so we're still learning something. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a new file in here. And I uh, don't know what this file is going to be yet. Don't know what anything is going to be. But I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to set this up uh, for a 21-inch uh, length board. And I'm going to uh, set it for just like a simple 1 by 12, 11 and a quarter. Uh, I'm going to make it uh, 3 quarters of an inch thick. Now, what I'm going to do, and the reason why I'm doing a Q&A tonight, I want to kind of break up the, the joinery series because not everybody has the joinery jig or has the ability to do that type of joining and stuff. Um uh, but we're going to get back to it next week because we're actually going to build a project next week and we're going to utilize some different joints in this project. And I'm, I'm designing a nice little jewelry box with some drawers and things and we're going to see if we can put things together, little inlays and stuff like that. But um, the uh, uh, what am I trying to say? Blah, 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 blah. So we'll get back to the joinery series next week. Okay, let's go ahead and throw in. We've already got some questions coming out. Paul, uh, my CNC USB says it has an update. Can I skip it to upgrade to TNG? Paul, before you can migrate over to TNG, your USB, your CNC USB controller has to be up to date, which is the 2.10.1807.2601 version. Uh, you have to download that latest version from planet-cnc.com. Don't click the check for updates in the software. It doesn't work. You would go to planet-cnc.com. You would go to products, software, and you would download the CNC USB controller 2.10.1807.2601. You would download that, run that, uh, that download, and it would ask you to update the firmware. And once you do that, once that firmware is up to that latest date, then you can migrate over to TNG, but before you do migrate over to TNG, your CNC USB controller has to be at the latest version. Okay, hopefully that helped. All right, you guys and girls keep asking questions and everything. And uh, well, hey David, welcome back. Tippy, welcome David. Tippy, I want to thank you once again this week. Uh, Tippy was a, uh, there was quite a few people at the show, but Tippy uh, hung out with us all weekend. Uh, brought some of his beautiful flags and projects and his two-sided marble maze, which was pretty awesome. And uh, hung out with us and helped me out on Sunday, uh, packing up uh, so I could get out of uh, Georgia and get back to Florida. So thanks, Tippy, for that. Really appreciate it. All right. Um, so for this job that I'm setting up, you know, I'm just setting up a blank job here. It's going to be a single-sided job. And um, the uh, I'm going to touch off on the surface material or the waste board, the machine bed. Now, you know with me, I have my uh, cam clamping jig on my CNC, my waste board slash jig that holds my materials. And I always work off the bottom of the material for my setups and stuff um, when I'm cutting through the material so I don't cut in and spoil my spoil board. Well, this project here, so I'm not gonna cut anything out. It's just gonna be something simple I'm carving. So I'll work off the machine surface for this evening. And then, but I will always, uh, you know, because of my setup and everything, I am going to start from the bottom left corner. Now, let's go ahead and click OK on that. We'll get a job set up here. All right, uh, Kevin, congratulations on just ordering your Laguna 4x8. Sorry to hear that. You know, we'd love you to have a digital woodcarver 4x8, but understand. <laughs> just kidding. All right, buddy, good going on that one. Okay, uh, let's see here. Kevin, I am trying to set up a clock face. But I'm having a head hard time getting the numbers lined up. Getting the numbers lined up. Okay, so let's uh, talk about that. So uh, I'm gonna go ahead and let's draw a circle here on the screen. And here, let's do this. Let's do this. Instead of working off the bottom left corner, let's work from the center so you guys and girls can see the grid lines and you know the centers and everything. But I'm gonna go ahead and um, I'm going to create a little center spot here 
and we'll make this uh, 0.25 diameters, okay? And uh, I'm going to uh, come in here and let's grab the, let's see here, what do I wanna do? Let's do a circle here. Let's do a big circle. Let's go one inch diameter there, okay? Now, to get our numbers, our 12 numbers and everything, one of the best ways to do it is use your circular array tool, your copy array tool. And um, now we have different numbers, Roman numerals and things like that. One, two, three, four, five, all the way to 12, of course. You know, 12 being the top. But let's get, let's get an outline laid out where, where things need to go. And so one of the best ways or one of the ways that we can do it is let's take a polyline and let's run a polyline all the way across, kind of down here and use the space bar. And I'm gonna take this polyline and I'm gonna use the circular array tool. And on the circular array tool, I want uh, the rotation center to be zero, zero, okay? And so let me make sure that my polyline, before I do this, let me make sure my polyline is centered on my material. So let's go up to material, up and down, center. Make sure it's centered, there we go. And uh, let's go back into that circular array tool. So zero, zero center, and I want, you know, uh, uh, however many copies, in this case, I'll go three copies, or six copies, uh, 160 or 360 degrees around. And I actually want 12, not six, I don't know why I said that. Uh, but if I go ahead and click copy, it'll create the positions where the numbers should go, okay? And, uh, you know, technically I could have done six, and I wouldn't have created, I created a bunch of duplicates when I went around twice, you know, uh, for 12. I could have done six, but that's fine. Uh, what we'll do is we'll come in here and we will select all duplicate vectors. And it says no duplicates, but there are. There are duplicates. You can see those dual lines and everything. So I'm just going to go through and I'm going to uh, select these because when we select these, they should be kind of a white dotted line like that, right? So let's go through, and I'm gonna, even though the software said there were no duplicates, uh, it is, there are duplicates. All right, so there's none there. That one's good, that one's good, that one's good. We're all good. Now, if I wanted to now, I, you know, depending on uh, how my, you know, where I want these numbers positioned and everything, if I wanted them positioned out at the end of the line, I would draw the length of my line accordingly and stuff. Uh, to where I wanted them to position, or I could just position them, uh, you know, I'll take my circle here just to give you another example. Let's take and revolve that around uh, 1, 2, 3, 5, 12 times. <laughs> Goofball that I am. Uh, let's make my rotation center 0, 0, and let's uh, copy that around. There we go. It's a nice place for position for our hands. And now if you wanted to, you could come in and let's say if I had, you know, my numbers. Uh, I'm just going to throw my numbers on the screen up here. And let's make them, I'll go a uh, half inch tall with that. And, uh, oops, don't close the tool. There we go. Let's zoom in over here. And what I'm going to do basically is uh, one. Oh, <laughs> hold on, guys. I got some notifications that y'all can't see anything because you're not seeing anything. Uh, let's get on over to the scene here and let's redo all of this. Lord have mercy. Lord have mercy, Lord have mercy. All right. All right, all right, all right. Need to see the VCAR program. Okay, okay. Gotcha, gotcha, guys. Gotcha. Lord have mercy. I messed it up. All right. Let's do this again. Let's start all over. One, two, three, and here we go. All right, so uh, I don't need to draw a circle here, but I'm going to draw one. Let's draw a quarter inch uh, diameter circle here. And uh, let's go ahead and um, make that a quarter of an inch just for kicks and giggles so we have it. Don't need it there, but, you know, what have you. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to take my polyline tool and I'm going to uh, draw a polyline on my screen. And I'm going to make sure that that polyline is centered. So I'm going to open up my alignment tool and I'm going to open it, uh, you know, center it on my, on my material here. And just for, uh, you know, verification purposes, I'm going to take and I'm going to snap 
a circle on the end of this and we'll make it a one inch diameter circle. There we go. Okay. Now on this polyline, I'm going to take and I'm going to open up my circular array copy tool. Uh, what's in the Coke, right? You better stop drinking Coke, right? <laughs> um, I was sitting there, uh, I, I knew I was missing a, a button that I forgot to click for you guys so you could see what I was doing. Uh, got to, I got so excited that uh, everything was working that I forgot to show you what I was doing. All right, let's open up that circular array tool. It's in your offset and layout tools, that third icon there. And my rotation center is going to be zero, zero, the center of my material here. And I want to go around 12 times 360 degrees. And let's go ahead and click that. That'll create these hands. Now, <clears throat> by doing that, what I was saying earlier is I created some duplicates. Okay, these lines are duplicate. I, I could have went, if I, would, if I were to undo that, if I were to click on this line here and come into the circular array, I could probably get away with going six times around. But see what happens when I choose six? You know, it, it spaces them out farther. So I want 12 want 12 and it's going to create duplicates and that's fine you know just uh when it, when it does just come in here and select the line and delete that duplicate select delete select delete select delete and what's going to happen when it does now we shouldn't have no duplicates if i go around this other half so we only got to delete six of those duplicates and things all right so now I've got the 12 even spaces or where my, where my clock hands could be. And just so you can see it better, I'm going to take the circle here and do the same thing. I'm going to zero, zero for my rotation center, 12 times around. And there we go. Okay. So now what I was saying is, is if we open up our text box, if we open up our text box here, not that text box, our draw text box, <clears throat> I can go ahead and start laying out my numbers. So let me just go with a simple Tahoma font on this for right now. And you can do Roman numbers, you, numbers, you can do you know a lot of different things, but I'm gonna go ahead and I'm just gonna start typing my numbers. One, enter, two, enter, three, enter, four, enter, five, enter, six, enter, seven, enter, eight, enter, nine, enter, 10, enter, 11, enter, and 12. And of course that enter, is me hitting the enter key so it creates the individual lines these numbers on the individual lines whether they're roman numerals or what have you now what i want to do is i want to right click i want to right click and i want to separate i want to break this text block that i've just created i want to break it up into text lines right so now all of these numbers are individual in things and uh you know from there i can go ahead and select on this and that center of that one i can snap to the center of that circle the center of that two i can snap to that center of that two you know the three i can snap the center of that to the center of that circle there and i can go on and on and on all the way around so for me that would be my easiest approach that would be my easiest approach to uh, to um, laying out that clock face. Okay? On and on and on. So, let me know, uh, Kevin, if this uh, uh, helps you at all or if that's uh, kind of what you were referring to or anything like that. But let me know. But this would be my approach if I were, if I were doing that. Okay? That's how I would lay out those numbers and everything. All right. Um, <clears throat> Kevin uh, Wilkerson asked, uh, can we install a tapered ball nose into the database from start to finish and having a hard time with that? Absolutely, we sure can. So a tapered ball nose, let's go over here to the toolpath side and let's go into our, our, our tool database. Now a tapered ball nose or uh, and we're going to click on Imperial Tools, or you can, if you have a category, you can always create a new group, right? And you could call it Tapered Ball Noses if you want. Like if you don't have that group, you could type in and create a new group down here. But I already have a group um, called Tapered Ball Noses. And so I would click on New. And now we have different types of uh, bits and end mills and things that we can cutters so that we can put in here. And your ball nose, your end mills, your V bits and, and, and things, they don't need any kind of special 
attention as far as drawing, you know, the profile. Our form tools like our OG bits and roundover bits and, and barley twist bits and rope bits, we have to create that half of that profile to, to add it to the tool database. But with a ball nose, we're gonna simply grab our tapered ball nose here and it's gonna open up some parameters. And right now these parameters have nothing to do with the particular bit that you're trying to install. Uh, and what we're gonna do is we're gonna come in and we're gonna choose. Now, one thing is, is the tapered ball nose, when it's asking for the diameter, it's asking for the diameter of the shank, not the cutting tip. The diameter of the shank, where that little D is. So my cutter, my, my, my tapered ball nose has a quarter inch shank. Now it's asking for the side angle, the included angle. And if we were to, um, you know, look at, let's say if we pulled up a page here and let's pull up a tapered ball nose. <clears throat> and let's go to shop router bits. And let's go down and grab a tapered ball nose here. We'll use an eighth inch taper as an example. So on the eighth inch tapered bit here, we got, it's an eighth inch uh, diameter, of course, 16th inch radius. It's got a 7.2 degree included angle. That's, that's what we need to know. So let's go back to our software and on our side angle, that's gonna be 7.2. Now our tip radius for this eighth of an inch is a sixteenth of an inch. And our pass depth, uh, generally with the ball nose, uh, I probably, I usually set my eighth of an inch ball nose uh, to either uh, take an eighth of an inch or a sixteenth, you know, half the diameter, you know, basically the radius of that bit. Um, if I were to look at my tapered ball nose here, um, if I were to, I don't wanna click on that, but, uh, Oh, what the hell would do that? Yep, I'm taking a sixteenth of an inch. Uh, so if I were to look at that, <clears throat> let's get back up to my uh, bit that's going on here. Sixteenth uh, of an inch, we would type that in, uh, uh, you know, for the radius. But the pass step, I'm taking an eighth of an inch. I'm letting it go down an eighth of an inch, you know, which is about the same as a ball. Now on your ball nose bits, uh, for a nice cut, a nice finish cut, that step over, I recommend an 8% step over. Now the clearance pass step over, uh, that is gonna be a little bit different. That can be a little bit higher. And it's gonna be somewhere between 15 and 20. Uh, for me, you know, whatever you want it is for you. And the clearance pass step over uh, really only play, it doesn't play a role in the finish cuts. It, it plays a role if you're using the bit as a, um, you know, if there's a clearing pass and all as a rough cutting bit. Now, if you have a spindle, if you have a spindle, you're going to be about 22,000 uh, to 24,000 RPMs for this bit. Uh, and uh, I run mine at 22,500 RPMs. The feed rate, uh, your feed rate can range depending on your machine. Uh, you know, uh, depending on the machine's capabilities, you can you can run, you know, bigger machines, four baits and all. You're running in the hundreds and, and things and all inches per minute. Uh, if you're rocking a digital wood carver 2440 or or, or a, you know a smaller unit, you're going your range is between 45 inches a minute and 75 inches a minute and in between. Uh, you know I usually run around 55 inches per minute. And the plunge, uh, like the plunge that when it's doing a finish cut, when the tapered ball nose is doing a finish cut, there is no plunge. You know there's that initial plunge, but it stays at that depth while it's running that carve and everything. So I set that to 20. And then we would click apply and that would add that bit to that tool database. And that's how you would add a tapered ball nose to your tool database. Hopefully that helped Kevin. All right. So let's um, come up here and let me get past everybody yelling at me about not seeing my screen. Give me a second, give me a second, let me get down. <clears throat> yes, Debbie, I do need to set a timer to check the chat ever so often. You're absolutely right. And I'm actually checking the chat very often uh, because of the fact that um, 
the, it's a Q and A class, so I have to read the questions. But I wasn't. I, I got into that part first part, and I wasn't checking it quick enough. All right. Let's see here. Bolt pattern not clear. What did it create? Duplicates. All right. SM says not clear. Why did it create duplicates? Why did it create duplicates? Well, I have a line that's on both sides, right? This line is not just running from the center. It's on both sides. So as it comes around, it's creating duplicates, it's overlapping itself. Now, if I would have taken this line and I, so let's snap this line uh, to the center here. And if I were to delete, all of these others. If I were to take this line and just have a half of a line and I come in here and I wrap this around 12 times, you see what it does, you know? So uh, it's creating those 12 in that small infringement. So let's undo that again and let's go zero, zero. And it wouldn't have done that if I'd had the setting right. I'm just screwing with you. Uh, rotation center zero, zero and click copy. And once again, we achieve our same goals and we, <clears throat> we do not have duplicates, right? So, you know, it's brought it around 12 times. There's no duplicates. It created duplicates because I was using a long line that was on both ends of that center point when it was rotating around. That's why it, that's why it created the duplicates, uh, SM and M. Okay. Um, RW says, uh, after importing and tracing a bitmap image of a mountain vector, I set it up for a 60 degree V bit, a flat depth of 0.25. Some lines cut shallow. How can the V carved lines be made deeper? All right. So let's understand uh, a how a you know the V carved toolpath and everything works and all and we can go from there. So let's imagine that I have a cut here and let's take and create a polyline All right. So the V-Carve toolpath looks at the space between any two lines and it automatically determines how deep it needs to cut based on the angle of the bit that we're using. You know, it automatically determines the depth of cut that that cut needs to cut to intersect and meet at a V. Let me get my 60 degree rock in here. Bear with me a second. And let me do a little bit of trimming. Okay. It automatically determines the depth of cut based on the degree of the angle of the degree <clears throat> of the bit. Now, if the lines in that design are closer together, then it's going to be a shallower cut. If they're wider apart, it's going to be a deeper cut. So if I had, if I took these lines, and let's take these line here and put it in transform mode and let's <clears throat> drag that over here. Let's drag that over here. Let's take our 60 degree bit here <clears throat> and hold down our control key. Let me get it centered first. Hold her tight. Uh, all right, so I wanna select that first, select that last, open up my alignment tool and align left and right, there we go. All right, so if the lines are closer together, it's gonna be a shallower cut, further apart, a deeper cut, on and on and on. Now, the there's two, there's a couple of options when you have close together vectors and things like that, because when you set a flat depth, if I set a flat depth 
If I limit my cut to a quarter of an inch deep, whatever that depth might be, okay, any part of that design, that doesn't mean everything is going to be limited to the flat depth, only the parts of the design that would normally exceed that quarter inch are going to be limited and flattened off. You know, so we may have on this narrower and all, we may have it, you know, almost a full V with a little bit of flat depth in the bottom, but this wider one is going to be limited, you know, majority of that cut. Now, if I had a, if I had a, a smaller, you know, area here that wasn't even coming anywhere close to a quarter, it's going to cut to a full V. All right. So, you know, we got to understand our setting our flat depth and what that flat depth does. It doesn't to bring everything to that depth. Only the areas that would exceed it are getting limited to that depth. Now, if I have a cut that is a little shallow enough and I want to add a little bit more depth to those narrow lines and things, I can either set a start depth, give myself a 10 thousandths or 20 thousandths inch start depth and all. That's going to make that bit plunge in instead of carving at the top of the board. Instead of carving at the top of the board, it's going to plunge down that 10 or 20 thousandths and create the carving from there. It's going to give you a little bit more definition. Or I'm going to use a narrower angle V-bit. Maybe instead of a 60, use a 22 degree V-bit. Okay. Hopefully that answers your question, um, RW. Let me know. All right. <clears throat> Kevin, uh, it's always great to have a chart uh, hanging and uh, read the package. Yes, sir. All right, Kevin. Wil that's Kevin Y. Kevin Wilkerson, you're welcome. Paul. Paul says, how to slow down moving speed of router on any particular project according to the type of wood, etc. That is the feed rate. Yes, the feed rate is how fast that bit is getting pulled and pushed and everything in the, you know around that material. The plunge rate is how fast that bit is plunging down into the material when that Z is coming down. And then your speed of the speed and feed portion. Feed is feed rate, how fast it's moving and getting pulled and pushed. Your speed is RPMs, how fast that bit, how fast that bit is spinning on the, uh, in the software, or you know, in the router, not the software, in the router. Now, if you have a spindle, water-cooled or air-cooled, typically your spindle is controlled by the software, the controller software. You can increase or decrease those RPMs uh, by do, decreasing and increasing them in the tool uh, itself, the tool database, or at the controller program on the fly. If you have a router, that RPM speed is controlled by the dial on the router, one through six, one through six. Okay. All right. But um, so if you need to slow down the moving, how fast it's cutting and everything, then you need to slow down the feed rate, Paul. All right, all right. And in TNG, you can do that on the fly. You can slow down by 10% increments if you need to, your, uh, your feed rate. And if you have a spindle, you can also slow or speed up your uh, spindle speed, RPMs, in the software as well. All right, James says, for an oval cribbage board, can you show how to do an evenly spaced peg holes around the outside? Absolutely. It's one of my favorite things to demonstrate because it is um, phenomenal. Great question, James Coates. All right, let's go ahead and let's get our uh, oval track here laid out let's say that this is our cribbage board rocking on here okay typically with a cribbage board there's 121 peg holes and sometimes they might be a single peg double peg or at least three they usually have like a racetrack of three going around and everything so what we're going to do is uh we're going to draw a rectangle here we're going to draw a rectangle uh and this rectangle is going to be uh a an eighth of an inch wide because that's typically the diameter of the holes for the pegs and stuff and it's going to have a height of one inch okay so we're gonna create that rectangle here. Now I'm gonna come in and I'm gonna open up my circle tool and I'm gonna draw an eighth of an inch diameter circle, 0.125. All right, awesome. 
Now I'm also going to take my, uh, and let me make sure that was a diameter. Let me go into size there. Yep, that is. Okay, great. Now I'm also going to take my polyline tool and I'm going to snap a polyline right down the center of that rectangle. Okay. All right. Excellent. Now, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to take this circle and I'm going to put it in transform mode and I'm going to drag out two more. One, not your shift key, Lainey, your control key. One and two more. There we go. All right, let's take those three circles, select them first, hold down that shift key and select that rectangle last. And then in our alignment tool, align to selection center. Now they're all stacked on top of each other in the center of that rectangle. And then I'm gonna come down and space that selection vertically to get that vertical equidistant spacing. All right, awesome. Okay, now on these three circles here, just the three circles, those three circles there. I'm going to group those together so they're grouped together as one. All right. And uh, on the uh, rest of it, uh, now I'm going to select it all and I'll group that together. All right. Now what I'm going to do is uh, now I've got something to follow my path. I've got my layout here to follow my path. And for that, I'm going to use the copy along vector tool. And on that copy along vector tool, we're going to copy an object and uh, we can copy circles, we can copy objects, you know, all kinds of things here and all. So what I need is in order to copy an object, I first have to uh, select, you know, I first have to select the object that I want to copy and then I got to select the path that I want to follow along, right? Okay. Now I don't want a distance between copies. I want a number of copies. And like I said, normally there's 121 holes. Uh, you know, but we also have start and stop time, you know, start points and stop points and everything. Uh, and so we usually kind of, uh, you know, have a space or something for that. And so what I normally do is I normally go about 150, 160, you know, options there and everything. And uh, with that, um, I can align the object to the curve. Uh, I can uh, create copies. I can put these copies on, on different layers and things and just go ahead and click copy. Uh, to get that evenly spacing all the way around, <clears throat> okay, from those three holes. Now, I've got 150 of these individual sections and things, and now I can come through, <clears throat> let's close this tool, now I can come through and I can delete, you know, where my start and stop areas are going to be. Let's say we... Uh, um, let's say we're going to start and stop here. Well, I'm not going to just sit there and delete it. I'm going to ungroup this. Um, and I'm going to delete the rectangle. I don't need that. And the circles, I'll go ahead and delete those. And that's going to leave me a line. Then let's go ahead and kind of get rid of however many we need, you know, uh, whatever, whatever, you know, uh, however wide or far apart you're going to, you know, have your stop and start point and everything. And once again, we'll, We'll, um, we'll, uh, uh, let's go in cause we gotta have our, we gotta have our start and stop holes. So I should have did the second one in on that. Let me undo that real quick <clears throat> and, uh, we'll ungroup that and let's get rid of these. Oops. Just the rectangle and get rid of the line. So these will be my starting holes. This will be my starting line here. And then let's kind of grab, you know, however wide. Now remember, we have, we have, we've created by doing 150, we've created, you know, basically uh, uh, 30 more than what we need, right? Uh, 121, 150, uh, we've created uh, 29 more than what we need. So does that mean we delete 29 of these for our start and stop point? Well, you, you figure out however you want to do it. Um, and everything because there you know I, I usually might have some voids or, or, or valleys and stuff that you know maybe maybe want some spacing and all so I'm gonna go ahead and get rid of uh, uh, these guys here and on this one I'm gonna ungroup it I'm gonna come in here and I'll delete this and this that'll be my uh, finishing line and then of course on this one I'll ungroup this and I'm hitting you the letter you ungroup is over here and edit objects tools guys uh, fifth icon ungroup but the letter u on your keyboard is the keyboard shortcut and on this on on these guys here i'll go ahead and select that rectangle and get rid of that and uh, get rid of those circles that'll be my finish line now 
every five of these, one, two, three, four, five, that sixth one is gonna get ungrouped and uh, we're going to come in and delete those and it's gonna have that spacing line. This is why that 150 because every every you know coming all the way around you know you're getting rid of every single one for every five you're getting rid of one and uh you know when it's all said and done you need 121 holes so one two three four five and number six once again ungroup and i'll come in here and select you know just the circles in that rectangle and delete so on and so forth and that's how you would uh, kind of lay out that cribs board and you want to make sure that you have 5 10 15 20 all the way to 120 when you're all said and done. So however many numbers, however many of that you need to add to create that open gap for your start and stop point. Uh, and then you have to take your in account every, every sixth one, basically you're getting rid of those holes. And when it's all said and done, you need 121. You would do the math yourself and figure it out. So hopefully James, that helps you create that evenly spaced perfectly laid out curves board on an oval all right so <clears throat> so you can change that only in the tool itself paul refresh that or rephrase that question uh a little bit so you can change that only in the tool itself are you saying you so you can change it yes you agree so you can change it but is it only in the tool itself or are you saying, so you can change that and it is only in the tool itself? Because I can change my feed rate here in the tool. I could adjust my feed rate when it's actually running in the controller program on the fly. I can slow down my feed rate and stuff and everything and all, uh, you know, in the in the controller program, the Planet CNC and stuff and all. But um, I'm not exactly sure what that statement or that question means or if you're just agreeing. But yes, you can adjust your feed and speed here. And you don't, when, you, when you're changing something for a tool path that you're calculating, don't hit select and change that feed and speed in your tool database. Those are your default settings. Don't change it here. Use the edit button and edit that feed and speed for that tool path that you're calculating. That way it doesn't change your default settings in your tool database. Okay. All right. Uh, let's see here. Do you have a great shortcut keyboard chart to print out? Kevin, sure do, buddy Row. Right up here in the help menu, keyboard shortcuts. When you go into keyboard shortcuts, every single keyboard shortcut that is available in the software and the different tools and stuff. Now you can always access this. You don't necessarily need to print it out, but uh, if you need to go to a specific function, uh, you can click on one of these and it will take you to the keyboard shortcuts for that function. Or you can print this out and just have these uh, three or four pages uh, at your disposal and stuff. Right under the help section, keyboard shortcuts. So once again, help. Keyboard shortcuts. All right. There we go. Great questions so far, guys. All right. Uh, let's see here. 121 holes, groups of five is the uh, is the finish line holes part of the last set of five. No. Nope. You have a finish line that they cross over in cribbage. And you have a starting line, you know, where all three pegs are set up and they're starting here and then they move along. And then, of course, when they finish, when they cross that finish line, you know, you there, there's, you know, that's not part of that set of five. Okay. So if I go one, two, three, four, five, this one here, if I were to ungroup that and uh, delete those, you know, I'd have that five and then the finish line. And then I could put some text in here, start, finish. I could put in some, you know, a 3D model or something in the middle and make a nice little cribbage board. But... The goal of it is, is right here, that one inch by eighth of an inch box, that line down the middle of the box, and then those three circles, eighth inch diameter circles, 
centered inside that rectangle and then spaced evenly using the alignment tools, space selection vertically and all in, and creating that. And of course, the reason why I grouped those circles together before I grouped everything together is when I come in here and ungroup these objects, I now have, I can now select my rectangle and then when I select my circles, it selects all three if I need to delete them instead of selecting one, two, three, delete, you know, type of thing. All right, all right. <clears throat> yeah, so if we look at the, um, the game of cribbage, um, and let's see here. So typically to 121, 61 to 121 is kind of, and then every so often you got different spacing and all, but let's hear, let's, let's rephrase this a little bit. How many holes in cribbage board? Google it. 121 holes. There are all, they, the, they are all continuous track on the cribbage boards available, which uh, have one continuous line of 121 holes for each player. Uh, and then, you know, that's it. You can, you can read more about how to lay out cribbage boards and all that stuff as well. All right. All right. <clears throat> all righty. Now, good questions, guys. Keep them coming. Keep them coming. Let's go ahead and, uh, we'll delete that. We need to make it again. It's just easy enough, but let's do that one more time. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, you should be able to just rewind if you need to uh, at the end of this class. All right, where's the skunk line, right? The skunk line on a cribbage board, if I'm not mistaken, is the halfway mark. Uh, I'm not a cribbage player myself. I'm a Euchre player, uh, but let's see here. Uh, where is, I wish Rick Roy was in class tonight. He is a cribbage board master. That's what he makes. That's all, that's all he makes. Uh, where is the skunk line in cribbage? Look, somebody else has already asked that question. And if I'm not mistaken, it should be around, um, let's see here, uh, 200. A popular variation of the game played uh, 221 is a skunk double game for the winner if it loses. So uh, for the winner, if the losing player fails to pass the three-quarter mark, 91 points or more, and it is a double skunk, uh, quadruple game. Uh, if the loser fails to pass the halfway mark, 61 point, uh, that's also a skunk. So that's where your skunk lines would be uh, at the halfway mark, from what I know. All right, all right. Very good. There you go. Wayne threw up an answer there. Excellent. All right. Any other questions? Come on, keep them coming. Now, while we're, while, um, let's see, I've got my board laid out here while we're waiting for questions to pop up. And let's see here what we can make or manage tonight. Mm-hmm. All right. Any other questions, guys? Now's the time. This is a Q&A. If we don't get a lot of participation, then we're going to end early tonight because uh, I don't really have a class planned or anything. Um, so it's just Q&A. So keep them coming. I'm going to delete the original on this, and I'm creating a one-inch border here. And uh, I want to create a, uh, a nice uh, picture frame. 
and stuff. As a matter of fact, I'm going to undo that. Let's go with a one and a half inch uh, border. So let's offset that 1.5 inches. And I'm going to go in and draw a rectangle here. Now my rectangle, because my offset was one and a half inch, I'm going to go that one and a half inches wide on that rectangle. And because my board is three quarters of an inch thick, Oh, I don't want I don't want my profile, you know, coming, you know, all the way down to the bottom of the board. I'd like to leave a little bit of an eighth of an inch here, you know, an eighth of an inch, and then the profile start. So I'm actually on the height. I'm going to type in the letter T, and I'm going to subtract that eighth of an inch T minus one two five that I want to keep. Okay, that's the eighth inch I want to keep from the thickness. That's what the T stands for. I'm going to hit equals, and that's going to put that .625 in there. All right, all right. So now from here, I can go ahead and go into node editing. And let's go ahead and delete this bottom span because we don't need that flat bottom. We just need what our profile is going to be. And uh, importing a 3D image from Rhino. Any 3D model, Kevin, that doesn't necessarily have to be from Rhino. Uh, but uh, a 3D image or a 3D model Let's go into our modeling tabs here and let's go ahead and create a, uh, or turn off uh, layer two here and go back to layer one where my got a blank slate going on here. And let's import a 3D model because a lot of people still struggle with importing a 3D model. Um, and so let's go in here and let's uh, grab a 3D model. Let's see what I, oops. Um, ba -da -ba -ba. Downloads. Now, the first thing you got to do when you import a 3D model is you got to orientate that model. The software doesn't know how the artist created that model and what the artist considers to be the front, the back, the side, the left, the right, and all that stuff. So once that model imports, then it's going to automatically throw us into the orientate model screen, which you're going to see here in a minute. This is a pretty big little model here. A pretty big little model. Isn't that a contradiction in terms? It's a pretty big model, so it's going to take a second for it to fully load in here. And then... Uh, <clears throat> there it comes. It's loaded. Now it's going to take a second and read that, and it's going to bring that model in. Big file. Big little file. He's a big little man. All right, let's take a sip of this Coke. Gosh forbid, hopefully nothing goes wrong if I do. All right, let that finish loading. It's a big file, so give it a second. And let's see here, while it does, uh, is there going to be another training session like we had in Indy? What's what training session did you have in Indy? Oh yes, yes. So, uh, Wayne, we have we have three training sessions, digital woodcarver user groups uh, conferences. If I'm not mistaken, is what you're asking for. Uh, we have our Northeast group, which is in Easton, PA. We have our Southeast group, which is going to be held in Ocala, Florida, and then we have our Midwest group, which is going to be held in Ohio, uh, and. Um, the uh, if you want to register, those are available now to register for one of those three classes. And the schedule for those classes and everything are on the Digital Woodcarver website, digitalwoodcarver.com, and then uh, Digital Woodcarver User Group event. Um, at the top menu, you would uh, click there and everything. And it will give you the list and you can register and register early, you know, try to get registered in because uh, seating is limited and uh, once they're gone, they're gone. So Paul says, okay, I, so I have everything set to run. Got everything set to run. How do I slow down the feed rate besides going into the tool edit box? So, if I come in here, and I'm assuming, Paul, that you're running Planet CNC TNG, 
uh, while that model loads, that model's still loading. Bear with me a second. I might have to bring in another model if it doesn't uh, kick into high gear pretty soon here. Stand by while my TNG loads there. All right, here's my model. Uh, let's uh, let's let's get let's answer this quick question real quick uh, for uh, Paul. Then we'll get back into importing that 3D model in your TNG software. You get a little speedometer, you know, right here on the screen, um, Paul. You got a little speedometer here, and you've got uh, you know you can rack down by 10% increments. You can slow down that speed. You can speed up that speed in 10% increments, or you can level out that speed back to 100%, which means the speed that's in the, the actual toolpath itself. So you can slow down, you can speed up, or you can level out in the TNG software under your speedometer right here, your speed. To click on it, it's a button. There you go. All right, so when we bring in a model, the first thing we have to do is we have to orientate that model. Now, I'm in the proper orientation being a top orientation right now. This is the proper orientation for this model. But this model could have very well been, um, you know, sideways. And let's scale this down to an appropriate size here. So give it a second. Let's scale this model down a bit. Doesn't matter if it's a Rhino model, if it's an STL, an OBJ, you know, whatever the case may be. Uh, in the CNC USB controller, uh, right underneath your X, Y, Z, and A, you've got a SPD, your speed box, and you have an OVRD, override. To the next of that override box, you want to go ahead and check off that override box, and you have a slide bar so you can slow things down. Now, in the CNC USB controller, it doesn't just slow down the feed rate. It overrides everything, your plunge rate, feed rate, and all both uh, in your ramps and stuff. So when you're slowing down, you're slowing down everything, which is fine. Not a problem with that. But anyway, it's the OVRD box. Put a check mark to the empty box to the right of it and slide your slider bar and slide down to where you need to go. All right. So let's... Uh, Man, this model is giving me some, it's, it's struggling with me for a second here. Uh, uh, uh. Rebecca, I'll get to that open vectors question here in just a moment. Hang tight with that. And uh, when tracing, uh, what did the corner fit noise filter do on a bitmap fading and stuff? Uh, those are great questions. Hang tight. Let's get past this one here. Uh, let me go ahead and uh, save ourselves a little bit of uh, time. Let me bring in a different model. This one's big. And uh, Vetric is just not, is struggling with it. All right, let's open up that Vetric again. That model's a little bit big, and uh, it's struggling with it. And we don't have time to wait. I have time when I'm working with it, when I'm actually working with that model. But we don't have time right now because we're in a live stream and there's plenty of questions to answer. So we're going to create a new file. Uh, let's go ahead and click OK. And let's go back into modeling and import 3D model. And let's go ahead and come back up. Let's grab a different 3D model. Uh, let's go with a... All right, once that model's imported and everything, we want to go ahead and orientate it. Now, this model could have came in sideways, right? It could have came in upside down. It could have came in in, in different orientations and stuff. So what we need to do is we need to orientate it properly. And in this case, I want a top orientation uh, because when it flips, that is my top, you know, uh, the top of my board. And if I were looking at this down in the Z view, right? If I were looking at this in the Z view, meaning I'm looking straight down on this, this is the front of my board down here. This is the back of my board. And if I were to click front, right, you know, we're going to be seeing the front. If I were to click back, 
you know, let me see him back. You know, and actually, and I was backwards on that one. I was saying that a moment ago. Up here, think about how your board's flipping. This is the back, this is the front. And I did say that. That was right. Okay. Now, once we have this, and let's kind of get into a side view here now. Uh, and the Y view. Now, when that model comes in, let's go ahead. First thing we're going to do is we're going to size it down. Let's get it to an appropriate size. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, my Y is 11 and a quarter. So I'm going to go ahead and just go 10 on this. And uh, let's click apply. Get that size down. All right. Now, you notice this black line here on the screen. This is like this red box that you see here. And let's see if we can zoom out and get everything full screen here. Uh, this red box is my board. That's my three quarter inch board here. And this black line is my zero plane. Okay. And that model, if I were to center this model onto my material right now, it's going to also center the model, not only along the X and Y, but also in the Z. And now my model is halfway below the zero plane, halfway above it. Well, this is a one sided model, not a two sided model. So I need to slide my zero plane position. I need to slide it down so my model is above that zero plane. Okay, let's get back into kind of a skewed view here so you can see uh, where we're at. All right, so I need that model above the zero plane. Now I can discard anything below that zero plane. If there's any good material that I want to get rid of below it, I'll go ahead and just keep that check. And then I will click OK. And that is rinse and repeat how we bring in a model, any model file. When we're importing a third party model file, we must orientate that third party model file. Once we import it, we need to orientate it, size it, and then when we click OK, it'll bring it into our job and we can work with it. All right. All right. All right. So let me know if that answered your question. Okay. So let's go back up here. What is the winning lottery numbers? Yes, Tippy. I wish I could answer that question, but I do not know. Importing a 3D image from Rhino. We just covered Kevin. Hopefully that helped answer that question. Uh, is there going to be another training session like we had in Indy? I've answered that one. Uh, let's see here. At least making a nice bowl to hold a rough 3D design to smooth it out. Making a nice bowl to hold a rough 3D design to smooth it out. Elise, is that a question? Making making a nice bowl to hold a 3D, a rough 3D design to help smooth it out. Let me know if that's a question or if it is, can you please rephrase it just a little bit to make it more so I can answer it correctly. Um, how to use the measure tool to leave the measurements on the screen. Wayne, when you're using the measure tool, there are two forms of measurement tools, okay? There is the measure tool under edit objects. This is like having a tape measure, okay? You take that tape measure off your belt loop, you grab your measurement, and you put that tape measure away. When you close that tool, the measurement goes away, right? It reads it off the side and everything. But we also have the add dimensions, the dimension tool, add dimensions to our 2D drawing. So with the add dimension tool, we can do a length dimension, we can do a vertical dimension, we can do a horizontal dimension, angles, and arc dimension. Okay, so let's say if I needed to do a vertical dimension on this eagle here, and I click here, and I click down here, and I want to pull in, you know, I can throw in that measurement there. Now, let's say if I want this measurement to be a little bit bigger, uh, if I tried to click on it, I'm gonna, it's going to want to start doing another measurement, right? Hold your shift key down. If you need to edit an existing measurement, hold your shift key down, and then you can come in and you can edit it. So I want to change my text height a little bit. I want to go a half inch tall, you know, or I might need to use, uh, you know, custom text here and say, uh, uh, Let 
don't know, whatever you want to type in there, the AGI GST, you know, whatever, you know, um, you can use custom text and all that stuff. But uh, yeah, there you go. That's your dimension tool. Okay. Now, if I had a circle, right? If I had a circle, let's uh, let's draw a let's draw a box. Let's 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 kind of use the whole dimension tool and everything. All right, and let's go in and use that dimension tool. All right, so let's say I want to do an arc dimension. I can also show the diameter, right? So if I come over here and select on an arc, it's going to show me the four arcs of this circle. And you know, when I come in here, I can uh, click and let's say I want to add this uh, down here. It's 2.0 diameter, right? If I didn't have that diameter selected, you know, if I didn't have that diameter selected and everything, then I'm going to get the radius. Okay. All right. So now let's say that, uh, you know, horizontal is horizontal, you know, left to right type of thing. Uh, vertical is vertical, you know, top to bottom. It's automatically going to snap to those points. Length is measuring a length, you know, so if I was measuring from this corner to this corner and I was measuring that length and all, but then I have angle dimensions and everything. So angle dimensions, I start off on the corner and then I'm going to come out here somewhere and then I'm going to pull up an angle. And in this case, it would be 90 degrees, right? You know, so whatever my angle is. And I can measure the outside dimension or the inside dimension. Now, the inside dimension is going to be 90 degrees, right? But the outside dimension is not. So if I were to do that again, uh, oops, if I were to do that again, one, two, three, and I'm doing the outside dimension, it's going to be 270 degrees, okay? All right. All right, and that's how you would add a dimension to a 2D drawing. Excellente. Um, I'm going to get down to that picture question here in just a second. I'm just kind of going in order here. Uh, let's see here. So I have everything ready to run. Okay, uh, answered that question with Paul. When tracing a bitmap, uh, what do the corner fit uh, and, the, and, the, and the noise filter and all do for that image? Let's go ahead and uh, let's get out of this tool. Always close your tools when you're done. And let's delete that. And let's import a bitmap image. So we're going to come in here. I'm going to go into pictures. And let's see what I have for pictures. Downloads, what I have. All right. So when I'm tracing an image in the trace bitmap tool, I can do a color trace or a black and white trace. Now a color trace means that it's gonna look, and let's turn the fading, and you wanna know what the fading does? All the fading does is fade that image in and out. Okay, it just fades the image in and out. That's the bitmap fading. So let's turn it to none so we can see all these colors. And if I zoom in real tight, we have all these a variety of shades and everything. So the software is going to lay out, if I'm using the color trace, it's going to lay out 16 of those main shades. Now, I can reduce those shades. I could come in here and say, okay, I only need to see, you know, maybe 10 of them or four of them or whatever the case may be. And it's gonna, as it does that, it's gonna turn, start converting this image to a true black and white, getting rid of those shades and everything uh, for me to check off. I definitely wanna check off the black, right? And I definitely wanna check off the gray, right? To get a full fill in there. And then I can go ahead and preview the, the thing. Now, let's say I'm a little loose in my corner fit. And where the corner fit is, is when it draws the lines, and this is a very pixelated, very poor image here, but, um, when it draws the lines, the inside corners and outside corners of the design, do we want it to be a loose fit or a tight fit? Now, if I'm too loose, if I'm too loose, then, you know, the fit is going to be a little sloppy in things. If I'm too tight, let's undo that. If I come in here and too tight and all and preview, 
then my lines are more rigid. They're not smooth. There's no smoothness to them. They're very straight and rigid lines and everything. Now, Vetric had their act together when they created this software, and I'm a big fan of the default corner fit. The default corner fit is that perfect little element uh, creating that nice uh, combination of contours and everything for those lines and stuff. And it's going to, you know, do its best to try because I'm ignoring two pixels. You know, we can ignore noise filter. We can filter out all of this pixelation. We can filter out these pixels and all and ignore anything 10 pixels or less. And my default setting is two. And what does that mean for us? Well, let's come in here and let's look and see. So if we look at this, at a, if let's go and let's undo this. And let's turn this noise filter down to one. So anything one uh, pixel or less, it's going to uh, ignore. So if I preview this, there, there's not a whole lot that it's ignoring, you know, and it's grabbing, you know, a, a bunch of stuff, right? If I turn that filter up, if I um, turn that filter up, let's say I turn that up to 10 pixels and I preview this, then we look at this design and we look at the lines and everything. It's starting to ignore, you know, some of the noise, these little boxes, all this noise right here. I don't know if you can see all this noise in here. This is noise and it's ignoring more and more of that noise, those pixels and things. And so, you know, we can, you know, have it ignore more or less of that noise. Uh, and to give you an example, uh, here, you know, all of these pixels around this, this guy here, it's ignoring a lot of them. If I were to change this down and click on this image and let's change this back down here and preview that. Oops. Sorry, I got to have a color shade check. Sorry. Um, if I were to turn that down and preview this, we're going to get more of that uh, of, of that selection and when you have a really bad pixelated image there's not a whole lot when there's all little specks running around here and floating here's a good example you see that dude right there you know he's gonna he's gonna end up being ignored uh, even this little guy right here if I have this filter turned up and when I preview let's undo Control Z when I preview this and everything, you know, it's going to ignore less and less of those things. So the noise filter, and I use two, or I just turn it up. And let's find a pitch or a let's find a an area that really doesn't show a good example of noise filtering. Let me see if I have. I don't have a whole lot of noise. I got that little guy right there. Let's go into a black and white scenario. And let's preview this. And you see, you see with my noise filter turned down, you see how that line shot out here? It's picking up this pixel. If I turn that noise filter up and we preview this, let me undo, and we preview this. Don't give me a hard time. Don't give me a hard time there, buddy Roo. Get back to my default. It's a bad example too. Uh, noise is noise. Filters, pixels, all these pixels have numbers. Let me see if I can explain this in the best way possible. Let's get back to a color so we can see all these shades of color. Let me turn off these colors here. All these pixels have you know, a value assigned to them. Don't ask me what it is. I'm not a photographer and I don't deal with pixels, okay? So, 10 pixels or less is noise, junk. And we can turn up the noise filter to filter out some of that junk. <laughs> and uh, in this case, I want to filter out, you know, eight pixels or less. And when I preview this image, first of all, let me fill in my color here, okay? You know, there's not a whole lot of noise there to, to filter out. And if I convert it to a black and white, that noise is gone type of thing. So I can filter out more or less. It's a terrible answer, but you get it? You get it? You got to get it. Come on. It's common sense. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, it's, uh, 
these are these are noise. So you're you're standalone little pixels that you see all over the place. Who is? Leave it to Terry that works for us to to call me during a class. Terry Terry doesn't know. He's he's like I don't watch your class. <laughs> he doesn't have internet. I gotta give him gotta give him that. He doesn't have internet. Um. All right. So, but this, like, this little guy right out here all by himself, you know, he's noise. And, you know, if I have my filter down low, it may not ignore it. Now, he is probably one pixel or less and also it probably won't do anything, you know. But you see, uh, you know, he's noise. And the reason why it selected that is because I just drew a selection box around this guy. Now, you didn't, you know, I don't know if you know about that, but you can draw a selection box around something and you can only trace around that area if you want to. You can you can limit out you know your picture. So if I came in here and I just wanted to trace this eagle's head, you know, I could trace just the eagle's head, you know, and not the rest of the design. Did you know you could do that? Probably did. All right, mean eater. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, that's one of the new tools uh, with our our filter tools and all. It's, but I think I think that came out in eight or eight point five. Uh, when that came out and it was pretty cool because we can now you know if I click apply and close if I turn this image off you know I've got just the area that I wanted to trace you know what I mean so that's pretty cool I think that came out in 8.5 if I'm not mistaken I'm not 100% sure on that one but anyway noise filter now let's get back to our trace bitmap tool I don't have an image in here so let's control Z on that delete can Turn this, or not that, let's control Y on that one. Let's turn our bitmap layer back on here. <clears throat> and let me see if I can find, I know I've got a picture with a lot of crap uh, noise and stuff. Because that wasn't really proven my, my uh, point. Or it wasn't really answering my questions. Give me a crappy photo. Let's see if this heart, yeah, this heart is grabby, I think. Oh, it looks bad. All right, let's go in here and <clears throat> let's take and slide this out. And I've got, like, you see these floaters out here and stuff? You know, I'm going to use my default corner fit. I'm going to use my default noise. I'm going to preview this, okay? And it's ignoring it already, even at two pixels. Well, if I turn this down to one pixel, in preview let's see if it kind of grabs it you see how it grabbed it right I don't want that in my tracing you know so I'm gonna turn my filter up accordingly and have it ignore those low trashy pixels and things until I get the design of the preview that I want and if we look here all of these guys right here that would normally have gotten selected they're not so if I were to turn that filter down and preview you'll see all of those things get selected here and if I turn my noise filter up I'm gonna crank it up to 10 and preview you know you'll see everything 10 pixels less has been ignored right that a better example of what that noise filter does uh, <clears throat> corner fit default corner fit and all that stuff if I turn my corner fit up too tight right preview this my lines are rigid you see how rigid and stiff they are right if I'm too loose, if I'm loose on my corner fit and everything, then they're kind of, you know, round and wobbly and sloppy and all that stuff. That default corner fit is a nice, happy medium and everything. Yeah. Yeah, I like the default corner fit. All right. And fading, all that does is fade that image in and out so I can see my tracing, right? If I fade the image out, I can see the tracing. If I turn the fading off, it's the image, all right? That's what the feeding does. All right, let's get on out of here. <laughs> like my smart ass answers. All right, let's see here. Uh, oh boy, this thing is filling up. Let me get up back up here. Um, uh, let's see here. Rebecca, Rebecca asked a question a moment ago, and I am now getting to Rebecca. How do you locate open vectors when getting an error that our open vectors exist while you're trying to calculate a toolpath? That is an excellent question, Rebecca. So let's say that I come in here and let's say that uh, let's create a couple of things here and all that wonderful stuff and jazz. 
Um, right, right. All right. Now, on this rectangle right here, I'm going to go into node editing mode, and I'm going to cut that vector right here on this corner. Now, when I cut that vector, that makes that open, right? Now, I'm also going to, uh, on this one, I'm going to delete this span. That is open, right? On this guy here, I'm going to delete this span and this span, and I'm going to make it an arc. That's an open vector where the two lines do not meet together. And on this one here, I'm actually going to trim to where it looks like these lines are joined in around that rectangle. But I've just, by doing that, that is an open vector. Okay. So, and let's go ahead and uh, trim this guy here. Right. And uh, you think, that, you know, let's see, let's trim it here. Let's make it look a little realistic. Let's say that we're connecting, trying to connect these two rectangles together. And we got this line here. That is an open vector. So, Let's go ahead and um, when I get a warning saying, hey, you've got all these open vectors. And what she means by that warning is, is if I was trying to do a, uh, oh, hell. Uh, pocket toolpath. You wouldn't do a pocket on that, but just as an example, calculate. Five open vectors were identified. They're being ignored. There's none remaining, right? All of them are open. So that, that warning sign. Well, how do we detect them? Right click, selection, select all open vectors. Okay, it's gonna select all the open vectors. So these are the open vectors. These are the vectors that I've gotta fix. So what that means is, is okay, I've got an open vector here. So how would I, how would I close these? Well, one, let's come in here and let's uh, trim that to there. And uh, let's come in here and uh, get rid of that. Let's go ahead and take my arc tool here and let's kind of snap from here to here. And uh, that was that was my curve tool. Hold on a second. <clears throat> let's take my arc tool and snap from here to here and arc that up. Oh, you son of a gun. Work with me there, sexy. Work with me. Okay, and then let's take uh, this guy here and let's take my polyline tool and let's come over and we'll come down over, wake up, open that up. And then now I've got this one to contend with. So let's go ahead and let's go into node editing mode and let's click on this guy right here and let's insert a point there and let's delete this span and delete that span and let's take and draw a line here here and snap to there all right and now all of these are still open vectors if i right click select all open vectors it's still an open vector because none of those lines that i just connected are joined now I'm going to come over to the join tool and I've got six open vectors selected. When I click join, I'm going to have one closed, right? So now I have one closed vector. So if I right click and select all open vectors, there are no more open vectors in my design. So we have to, we have to close them off somehow. That means that the end of the lines, the end of that shape connects in some way or fashion or another. And let's make this a little less complicated. Let's just draw a rectangle here. Okay. And on this rectangle, let's go ahead and delete this top line here. Now, this is an open vector, so I have a choice. If I try to use my join tool, it's still an open vector. The gap is too wide here. I can change my tolerance, but it would be a very big tolerance and it's gonna throw the design off. So the join tool will not be the option in this case. So let's go to our second option, join with a straight line. There we go, that'll join and close it off, right? All right, let's undo that. How about join with a smooth curve? The next one we can, you know, join with a smooth curve and we can edit that smooth curve and reduce it down. All right, that's option number two. Or how about join by bringing the two endpoints to a common point of intersection, which kind of bring them together to create that triangle. One way or another, we have to join and close that vector. But how you find them, how you find them 
is you right click selection select all open vectors and it will identify those open vectors by selecting them awesome hopefully Rebecca that helped answer that question all right let's see here um, can we make a bowl for this model do no, for the eagle for the eagle model can we make a bowl for that model yep sure can uh, not well like yeah there yeah I can do it in here as well too uh, let's go back into modeling import model let's go down to Eagle let's import that Eagle one more time now and it's easier to create the dome and the dish for the models and all in Aspire which I, I don't know if you have or not but we can also do it within uh, here as well uh, let's size this back down to an uh, 11 inch board and click apply. Let's center this on the model, but bring that zero plane down. We want it above the zero plane. Okay. And click OK. All right. So on this model here, let's go ahead and now it's in our 3D area and stuff. It's also in our 2D view. So let's come into this model and let's uh, size it down a bit. And let's go into our clip art. And our clip art uh, that came with the software, we have domes and dishes. Domes and dishes. So let's click on domes and dishes and uh, let's do a nice little, uh, let's see, that's a 60, 90, I don't want a 90, maybe a 45, a 30. Let's go with a 45 degree dome and let's drop that dome on here. And let's uh, size that dome up. Okay, now when I say dome, let me split this view here so you can see that's a dome. It's domed up, but it's also a dome or dish because it's just a matter if, if we're subtracting or adding when it comes to the properties. So right now, let's go ahead and go back into that modeling tool and let's go into the properties of that dome, that 45 degree dome. And instead of uh, merging high, right? We can't merge low because that doesn't, that doesn't change the property of the dome. All that does is just throw, you know, it just kind of removes that area for that model to be in, right? That's not what we want. We have to subtract. We have to subtract this dome okay and then we're gonna take and we're gonna have this eagle inside of this dome so let's put it up at the top here and let's get this eagle sized up now properly and let's get this eagle centered let's make sure my dome is centered let's go back into our alignment tool center it all right, excellent. Let's grab our eagle here and make sure he's centered. He is. All right. And so now with our dome and dish, let's go and look at this down the Y view here and everything. And there's a little bit of my eagle above the dome and that dome is most likely going to be flush with the surface of my material. So I've got to bring the Z height down. Let's go back in our modeling tools. I got to bring the Z height down on that eagle ever so slightly. Uh, let's take and set it at an exact height right now. It's 1.3846. Let's go ahead and bring that down to a 1.25. I could actually, let's go 1.375. Click apply. See if we can reduce that down. Mm, still see a little bit of red in there. Let's go ahead and bring that down to one and a quarter. Or I could use a 60 degree dome or dish in, in, instead, you know. And um, let's close that. Let's cancel this. Turn that dome off for a second. Scale the Z height of that model by itself. He is 5.0. Let's set him to 5.015. Let's set him to 0.45 inches in height. Reduce his height down a bit. There we go. Now we can come back in here and click OK. And turn that dome and dish back on. 
and we should be below that surface. No more red in here. Okay, and that's how we would create a dome and a dish for that model. Pick your dome from your clip art, dome or dish. You've got choices of 30, 45, 60, and 90. And that dome is a dome, but when you reverse it, when you subtract it in its properties, when you subtract it in its properties, that turns it into a dish, dome or dish. And you can set that shape height however you want. All right, all right. If you had a spire, you can just draw a circle and go into the Create Shape tool and create a curved profile to whatever angle that you want. That's how you would do it in a spire if you were doing that. All right, let's see here. Um, it's put... All right, Jim uh, Cynical... Um, it puts the dimension on a new layer called dimension. So he must be asking, somebody must have asked a question about the dimension tool. It puts it on a new layer uh, because when you go into uh, gym, you might be answering somebody's question, you might be making a statement. But when you use the add dimension tool, you have the option in that add dimension tool to place the dimensions on their own layer and as a default, it is checked. And as a default, that layer name is called dimensions. You can change it to whatever you want, or you can just uncheck that, and it'll put it on whatever the active layer is. All right. Uh, we bought a laser at the show. I was watching installation video of your past episodes. It shows running some of the wire through existing cable some outside didn't you say to follow the entire cable trace you talking about the cable track yeah in my video my cable going from the uh, control box of the laser going around through the cat track and everything my cable wasn't long enough my prototype laser cable wasn't long enough so I had to go halfway through the track to get it to where I want Newer ones, like the ones you bought there, Paul, uh, they're longer. So you actually follow that router cable wire, that router plug wire. You're going to follow that all the way around, up and over to where the laser is going to be mounted. You know, you follow it all the way around. Uh, increased color options will increase noise, won't it? Yes, sir. Tippy. Rebecca Schultz, perfect explanation helps a lot. Thanks, you're welcome. Uh, what should the tolerance be set at uh, on the join vector area? Well, as a default for me, uh, it's 0 .004. But what this, let me, let's talk about that tolerance and what it does. So if I come in here and let's, let's come over here and uh, draw a rectangle. All right. And let's come in here and let's take, go into node editing. I'm going to cut the vector here and I'm going to pull, oops, pull this vector down just a little bit. Okay. Creating this little gap here. Okay. To make that open vector, that little gap right there. Now, if I come in here and I come into my join tool and everything, that gap it exceeds my tolerance of 0 0.004. So it's not going to close it off. So I can increase that. Let's go, let's go with a 10 thousandths, right? 0 0.01. All right. So it still exceeds that 0 0.01. You know, so it's not going to close it off. So let's go ahead and let's go ahead and make this 0.05. There we go. Now, you know, it's going to allow me to close that vector. But you see what happens and what it did? It didn't, it didn't, um, bring in and create a new line to close it off it brought this line down this line is no longer square you know it brought it down that tolerance and stuff so you don't necessarily want to do that you know if you have a gap or something and all and it's not selecting those open vectors because that gap is too wide use one of the other tools you know 
I set my default to 0 0.004, okay? That's what the default is. Now, how I would do this is there's two ways, two ways to, to do this. One, select this and join with a straight line. Number two, select this and use your extend tool and click here and then click here. Number three, select this, go into node editing mode and drag this node up and connect those two together. Okay. Now check your, after, if you do that method, that one there, check and make sure that it did close it off when you snap those two nodes together. And it should, but just make sure. All right. So. You, I, my default tolerance or the default tolerance that you come with the software is 0 0.004. That's what the default is. You change that tolerance based on what you want it to find and what you want it to close, but then understand that it's gonna it's gonna manipulate those lines and it's gonna change that design ever so slightly. That was supposed to be a rectangle. You know. All right. Yep, Camaro F9 centers it. Camaro's talking about the keyboard shortcut or of uh, centering to your material. The F9 key is uh, centering to your material. All righty. Need to add a zero plane for the dish. Yeah, well, what James, uh, what Jim is saying here is talking about zero plane for the dish. Well, Jim, there's a couple of ways that I that we can look at that, buddy Ro. Um, adding a zero plane for the dish simply means, uh, what, what Jim is saying is, is that, that fills in. If I came into my model here and, um, I add, let's go over to my job setup and get my model position and my material correct and everything. And let's bring that, uh, model, uh, right now it exceeds my three quarters of an inch. So let's size that down to 0.73 apply all right so what Jim is saying about adding a zero plane is if we go into our modeling we have an option here to add a plane component over the entire model all right, and what this does is this creates and it kind of fills in that gap so you can kind of see and all that stuff and it has a zero plane. But when I'm carving this, I absolutely do not want that zero plane on unless I'm, you know, if I, unless I specifically tell it uh, to use, if I go into create that 3D finish, you know, I have a choice of using the model as a boundary, right? The material as a boundary or selected vector. Well, I don't have a selected vector on this. I just have this. So if I come in here and I say choose that model as the boundary, thinking that it's just going to be my eagle dome and dish, think again. It's going to be the entire surface where that zero plane is. Okay. Let this calculate out and you'll understand what I mean. So I want just, I just want to carve in that dome area. I don't want, I don't want my bits resurfacing my flat board off or anything like that. And no, all I don't want, I want a nice transition from the top of my board down into that dish and stuff. Let this calculate out here. Let me, um, Oh, let me stop this and use a bigger bit so it doesn't take as long. Uh, let's go. All right, let that calculate out. So right now it's calculating my entire 21 by 11 and a quarter inch board because that that zero plane is now that zero plane is a model, right? So it's reading that zero plane as part of the component, as part of the model. So it's it's reading that entire surface, and I don't want that. I want it to carve just that eagle and dish and everything. But I want to show you, you know, what our options are, okay? what our options are. Now for preview purposes, if I want to just see what my model looks like with the board and everything, what it would look like and everything, then yeah, I'd add that zero plane in there and stuff. But when I'm calculating the tool path, absolutely don't want it in there, you know. Um, I wouldn't. Dum, 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 dum. 
Come on now, finish air up, boy. That's a big old. I have a drink of Coke while we're waiting. All right, that second little pass is going to race right across there. All right, so now it's surfacing the entire surface and everything. That's not what I want. What I want is I either want to use, let's come in here and let's select on this and hold down our shift key and select on this. And let's come in and, and create a boundary around that. And I want to select that vector there. And I want to use the selected vector as the boundary, no boundary offset. And calculate that just on that selected vector, that model and everything. All right. Just want to, I just want to carve that model. Now I'm using a quarter inch bit here, so it's going to look like crap. But anyway, you know. I want, I want to just the nice transition just to that area there. Or option number two, get rid of the zero plane, come in here and in that 3D finish, now you can use the model as the boundary, right? And it'll calculate just on that dome and dished eagle. Okay. All righty. All right. Either one. But that's what, when, when you see the uh, zero plane, what the zero plane is, that's just a nice way to add. Uh, um, and let's let's get rid of the preview and come back to our model here. When you're looking at this, you can see like the dome and the dish, right? You know, but when I add the zero plane in here, it just fills all that area in. Uh, and also we can kind of look at it and kind of get a look at it with a, you know, a nice, you know, solid piece of wood, what our dome and dish would be. You know? You know, awesome. All right, any other questions? Keep them coming, guys. These are great questions. Now I don't have all the answers. You know, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not uh, Buddha. <laughs> you know, who is it? Gandhi? I don't know. Whoever had all the answers. I don't have all the answers, but I have some that I could help you with. So now's the time to ask. And Paul, there's no such thing as a dumb Q. Apostrophe S. Or quote S. I'm just kidding. There's no such thing as dumb questions, Paul. Always ask. Never hesitate to ask a question. No matter how dumb you may think it is or how dumb it sounds, there's no such thing as a dumb question. Now, that being said, there are some dumb questions out there because if you know college professors what is it college professors they, they they learn not to say there's no such thing as a dumb question but like school young kids schools and all you know teachers you know there's no such thing as a dumb question then you can get some really dumb ones you know you know is it true <laughs> miss johnson is it true that i can get pregnant reading comic books some boy asked his teacher that's a dumb question uh, no, Tommy, you can't. All right, I got some misinformation from my sister. <laughs> you know, so there is a such thing as a dumb question. But in this case, don't ever hesitate to ask a question. <laughs> ah. That comedian that said that crack, I can't remember his name, but man, that cracked me up. He says he would love it when people, when, 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 when teachers said that there was no such thing as a dumb question and, uh, he would raise his hand and boy, oh boy, he could come up with some doozies. All right. Any other questions, ladies and gentlemen? All right. Okay, let's delete all that out of there. Come back in. Uh... I thought I had a layer two. Did I? Oh, I closed that. I was working on my design. I don't really have a design. Uh, what I was doing was drawing a piece of molding. Remember where we were? Uh, let's let's get back to where I was here. I had a one and a half inch. Uh... Oops. You son of a gun. Pop 
Pop that in there. Offset that in one and a half inches. Sharp corners. Offset inward. Um, and uh, I had a rectangle in here. It got deleted on me. So let's come back in here and let's create that rectangle. That rectangle was one and a half inches wide. And then I, in here I typed in T minus 0.125 because that's how much I want to keep uh, uh, of the bottom of my profile here. And now with my profile, I can come in and go into node editing. And I'm going to delete that span. All right, let's go ahead and bring this down a bit. And I want to uh, turn this line, I'm going to right click and turn it into a Bezier curve. And let's uh, kind of build that curve up a bit and kind of start coming down a little tighter there. All right. And I want to take and use my fillet tool here, and I want to put a small little radius right there on that. And uh, no radius on the inside there. Let's take, I want to do a double bead up here, so I'm going to go one. Ah, I'll go a little bit bigger on that bead. Now I want this bead to be moved down some. About like that. And then let's go ahead and create a nice little cove and uh, do I want something right there I think I want something right there let's put a put a bead right there all right I'm gonna take my trim tool here and I'm gonna trim 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 chimney Trim, trim, true. Mary Poppins people be coming after me. Now, on my ball nose bit that I'm going to be using here to get into this double bead, you know, it's not going to get in there. You know, I'm going to be using uh, a 16th inch bit, which has a 32nd inch radius and stuff. And um, so let me let me come in here and let me trim that little bit away right there. Um, if I use my, you know, tool here and if I come in and go 0 0.03125 and I come over here and uh, put that radius in there, that's about what my 32nd bit's going to give me and stuff and all. Funky looking little profile there, um, but it'll work. All right, I'm going to select, I'm going to go to my molding tool path for this and I'm going to select my path to follow. I'm going to follow that by my profile here and I want this to be a mitered frame now I'm actually going to use I'm not going to use a 16th I'm going to use a, uh, an eighth inch so my, my 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 bead might be a little bit odd looking uh, but I'm going to um, come in and create sharp corners for this and I want to calculate that out um, let's reset this preview back to a blank board and let's preview this molding that I just created and let's see what we come up with Let's zoom in here. Now, let's get our let's get our uh, view uh, quality simulation. It's in standard. Let's go with an extremely high view here, and let's preview that one more time while I'm reading these other questions. Uh, at the show after the crash, you set drill holes. Can you explain how and why? I guess there's some questions I asked the two hour session, maybe uh, only one hour is 59 minutes. <laughs> True, Paul. Um, <clears throat> so the reason for the sharp corners is I wanted this to look like a mitered picture frame here. So I've got my uh, little bead here. I've got my bigger bead with that kind of little step down right there and there. My eighth inch bit is going to cut it to however you know it's going to cut it. Then I've got that nice little arch type cove happening here. And then I should have a bead kind of finish up uh, right at the end here. And then it's going to come down to my nice little rounded over nose. There we go. All right. And so got a nice little frame profile there. And I've got about an eighth of an inch here and everything. 
So that's how we would create a picture frame molding. All right, so let's see here. After the show, after the crash, uh, you set a drill hole. Uh, can you explain how and why? Well, normally, uh, Tippy, we would set that drill hole prior to carving, okay? Uh, before the crash, right? And the reason why we had set those drill holes and stuff is because we were going to be changing machines and this project wasn't going to be finished, wasn't supposed to be finished uh, before we changed over from one machine to the other. And we wanted to be able to uh, get back to where we were when we moved this project over to the other machine because that one machine was getting sold. But what Tippy Looter's question is, is, uh, you know, let's say I'm doing a 3D cut or doing something, any kind of cut, not necessarily, but let's say that all of this area out here, let's say the cutting area right now is going to be within my pink boundary here, and I'm going to end up cutting a shape out or something like that, and all this area out here is waste. It's waste, okay? And let's say that in this scenario, because if I was working off the corner, I'd use my quick set and all that stuff. But let's say in this scenario, I'm working off the center of my material and all of this uh, center of the material has been milled away, right? It's gone. <laughs> Done, right? Bear with me a second while that builds back up. Okay. Now... <clears throat> When I, if I, all this is waste, I'm going to pick a spot somewhere on my board here and I'm going to draw a quarter inch diameter hole somewhere in this waste area, you know, where it's not going to interfere with anything. I'm going to draw a quarter inch hole and this is going to be my uh, recovery hole if I lose anything because that hole right now, if I go into the, the move tool here, the center of that hole, the center anchor point here of that hole this is the location from zero, from zero. And if, if my power goes out and I lose my X and Y and what have you, now all the center's carved away and it's going to be hard for me to find that center point again. I could stretch a tape measure across my board and try to find it that way or what have you. Well, I can simply and easily just put my quarter inch bit in and I can run back over to this hole that I drilled and it would be the first tool path that I did. It'd be about three eighths of an inch deep, quarter of an inch deep, it doesn't have to be very deep. But that'd be the first tool path I ran would be that hole before I did my main cut and all that stuff. So I'd move that bit back over and I'd drop that bit down into that hole to where it spins perfectly. And in my TNG software or my controller software, I'd go in in that X position, I would type in this coordinate here hit enter, lock it in. Then I would type in this coordinate here, hit enter and lock it in. And that is saying that right now that machine's absolute position is here, negative 9.9389. Negative or positive 2.8107. That's, that's where that bit is sitting inside the hole. That's its position relative to where zero was. So when I do that, it's gonna know from that point, that's where, you know, and I can now, it recovers my zero. Because these coordinates here, negative nine, point nine three eight seven, and 2.10, here, let's do this. I'm gonna draw a guideline. Uh, let's close this tool for a minute. Draw a guideline here and here, okay? I'm gonna take this guideline and let me get my numbers in my head here. Let me write them down. Hold on a second. This makes sense in a minute. Uh, negative 9.9389, oh, 2.8107. All right. On my X, the absolute position of this is going to be negative 9.9387. Nine, and click apply. Here, let's move this over. Click apply. Okay. And then close that. And on this one here, let's right click on that. Let's move this over. And this is going to be a positive 2.8107. That's what I would type in my, you know, click apply. And that is the center of that hole, right? Relative from zero. You know, if I came in here, now that I've programmed that in, now the machine knows where zero is because if I came over here and I said, okay, new position, zero, 
apply. There we go. If I close this and I grab this one and say new position, zero, apply, go. And that's going to be my, you know, zero, zero. So it knows where that coordinate is relative to zero. So if I drop my bit down in that hole, type in those coordinates inside of my controller software saying, hey, this is the machine's absolute position. It's the absolute position from zero. So it's a way to recover my X and Y zero. Okay. Can you explain again, touch off Z on your table option? I surely can. View, guidelines, delete all guides. Okay, let's draw this out. All right, stand by. <clears throat> Align left and right. So let's imagine that this is my tabletop, okay? And we're gonna just for kicks and giggles, we're gonna put this on a new layer. We're gonna move this to a new layer and we're gonna call it tabletop. And we're gonna call it, color it red, okay? All right, all right, okay. So if I've set my job up in the software, if I've set my job up to surface off or work off the Z zero position is the material surface, that means that this material position here at the top of my board, that is zero, okay? That is zero, all right? Now, where, uh, you know, some of the disadvantages of this is uh, if I'm cutting through my material, and let's say my I've got my job set up for three quarters of an inch, right? That's how thick my material is, three quarters of an inch. And I want to be able to set my cut depth to 0.75, not 0.76 or 0.77 or 0.78, just to make sure that I go all the way through. I want to set it to 0.75 because that's how thick my material is. But if my material is not quite 0.75, then what's going to happen is, is when I come down... And I come to cut, you know, it's going to go down from zero, the top of the board, down to 0.75 inches. And if it's not quite, if my board is a little bit bigger than 0.75, then now what's happening? I'm not cutting all the way through my material. All right. But what happens if my board, what happens if my board is a little bit thinner than 0.75. Let's say it's let's say it's 0. Uh, 0.68, right? 0. 0.7, whatever. Okay? And you know, 0 is uh, from here. Now I'm cutting 0. 0.75. Well, now what's happening is it's cutting all the way through my board and now it's cutting into my waste board. And it's spoiling my spoil board as it comes around and cuts. Because my board was a little shy of three quarters of an inch and I just told it to cut three quarters of an inch and now I'm cutting into my waste board and stuff. All right. If my board was thicker than three quarters, I'm, so I'm now, I'm not, now I'm not cutting all the way through. You know, if it's thicker than three quarters, now I got this little onion skin left and I got to go in there and change it to 0.76 or 0.77 to get it to cut and things. Well. Let's change that. Let's come over here and let's touch off and set Z zero as the bottom of this wasteboard. Okay. Now this is zero. 
Now I tell my project to cut to three quarters of an inch. My cut depth is going to be 0.75. Now the software is going to raise up. It's smart enough to know in my material setup here that my home start position is 0.8. That's the safe gap, that Z gap above the material. Not above zero, above the material. And my material is three quarters of an inch thick. So when I hit start, you know, that bit's going to raise up the three quarters of my material. Then it's going to raise up to the safe 0.8 home position above the material, my safe Z. And it's going to move over and it's going to start cutting. Now, if I have my set, cut depth set to cut to a quarter of an inch, three, you know, three quarters, sorry, 0.75. And if my board is a little bit thicker, you know, then that means my first pass it's going to be a little deeper when I'm making those multiple passes and everything. It's going to be a little deeper than an eighth of an inch. But as it goes through and it makes those passes and all, it's going to be cutting from 0.75 down to zero and never below zero. So now it's only kissing the top of that wasteboard. And if your CNC is trimmed, you're just kissing and grazing the top of that wasteboard. You're not cutting into it and spoiling that spoil board. Okay. Now let's say that my you know, um, zero is over here, you know, that's my waste board. And all let's say my board is just a little bit shy, but I programmed it in, oops, uh, but I programmed it in to be 0.75, you know, because I thought it was. I ran it through the planer and everything was hunky-dory. I thought it was 0.75, but it was actually 0.683, whatever. Now, I'm still set my cut depth to 0.75. Well, the software is going to cut from 0.75 which means my cut, my, my eighth inch pass depth, my eighth inch might be a little light this time on that first pass, and then it'll catch up to itself. But it's going to cut from 0.75 down to zero. Okay? It might even, might even be carbon air that first little pass. You know, a few, few thousandths of bit of air on that first pass and all, whatever the case may be. Doubt it would, but, you know, it's going to cut all the way down until it gets to 0.75, or to zero, sorry. To zero, the top of my waste board, zero. It's never going to cut below zero. So it's only kissing the top of that waste board. So I, I do a combination. I touch off on the top of my board when I'm not cutting through and it's a flat board and all. But if I'm using my spoil board and I'm cutting parts out, the spoil board is always where I touch off. And I always set up my job to work off the machine bed, which is the spoil board, what that project board is sitting on. Okay. Okay. All right, ladies and gentlemen, any other questions? If not, it's 9.58, two more minutes to 10 o'clock. That means we've been here for a while. We had a few screw-ups in the beginning. Hopefully, these answered some of your questions and kind of gave you some things, um, you know, to think some food for thought and things to think about and stuff. Um, and uh, uh, hopefully, you picked up something and all. And hopefully, Wayne, that explains that better. Now, Wayne, this is the second time, second class, you know, don't ask me a third time. No, I'm just kidding. You can ask me as many times as you need. I'll explain it over and over again. It's not a big deal. I want you guys to get it. I want you to understand. I want things to be clear because when you run into these obstacles, you run into these questions, you run into anything, I want you to know how to address them, overcome them, make them happen, whatever it is. So you keep asking those questions. There's no such thing as dumb questions. There's no such thing as asking questions over and over again. Because if you need those ask, if you need to ask them and you need answers, go for it. That's what I'm here for on Monday nights. And that's what hopefully I can be there for you guys. All right. I don't see any other things pop up. Thanks, Bob Paul. <laughs> Thanks, Paul. I appreciate that. Uh, all right. Hopefully these were this was helpful and uh, in and seriously, um, give it a shot. Uh, cutting, working off, starting off, uh, setting your machine bed as the bottom. If you're cutting through something next time, and uh, it'll make sense. And if you're one of those ones that set that cut depth to 0 0.77 or 0.76, just to make sure that you do cut through that material because it always leaves a little skin here and there. You may want to work off of the bottom of the material, which would be your waste board, because hopefully if you're cutting through, you have a waste board, right? Uh, and um, set that cut depth to 0.75 and see how it does for you. All right, ladies and gentlemen, until next time, y'all have a great week. See ya. Sorry about the mess up at the beginning of the show, but we got her rolling, didn't we?
Wayne, give me a call and let's do it over the phone on, on TeamViewer if it didn't work out for you. Uh, because um, there's something off if it didn't. All right. Till next time. See you soon. I want to thank you for joining us tonight on Spindle TV, your best source for CNC CAD CAM training videos. If you're watching Spindle TV on YouTube, be sure to hit that thumbs up button and subscribe. You can find out more information about our training and products by visiting us at www.digitalwoodcarver.com.